Yo, what's going on, everybody? Uh, welcome to Servant of Christ Ministries. Hope and pray you guys are doing well today. Um, I'm looking forward to today's study. Uh, if this is your first time here, I would like to personally welcome you to Servant of Christ Ministries, where I aim to explain the Bible in hopefully an easy to understand way. Now, if this is your first time, again, we are actually in the middle of a series called the Sermon on the Mount series. We are currently at Matthew chapter 5, verse is 31 and 32. So we're covering two verses but they are definitely packed with a lot of really good information. Uh, so before we get started, I want to give you a kind of a synopsis. So we've been walking through the Sermon on the Mount, and last week we were talking a little bit about adultery in the heart and how sin begins in the mind, begins in the heart, and how it actually continues into our actions. So we talked about how serious that was. Um, and today we're going to be delving into divorce, which is not only a hot topic in you know Christian Christian circles, but it's also a very hot topic in today's world. So I thought it would be a very good uh, way for us to kind of talk about uh, some of those issues that are happening in our world and how it affects uh, people individually and also people as a group. And I would love to hear some of the effects that you've seen maybe in your lives in the comments section if you're joining us live or if you're not, you're watching this on the replay. I want to I want to ask you and if you're willing to share any instances in where you witnessed divorce um, have a tragic uh, kind of hard thing or hard issue in your life, if that makes any sense. Uh, basically, the impact of divorce in, in society. Um, and most like and I also want to say that uh, at the end of today's stream, um, I'm going to be answering a question from the comment section, which kind of gives you a little incentive, right? If you want one of your questions answered, make sure you put them in the comment section or in the live chat. Uh, and perhaps and I'll choose one of your questions and add them to the end of one of our streams. Uh, but the question we're going to be answering today at the end of today's stream has to deal with our stream last week. And the question is on whether or not a person is actually still held accountable if they try to reconcile with a brother or sister in Christ, but for some reason that person cuts you off and doesn't allow you even the opportunity. Are you still held guilty? Are you still liable in, a, in maybe a legal sense, right? And I'll definitely answer that question at the end of today's stream, right before we get into the Q&A. Uh, also, I do want to send two special shout outs to people who have supported the channel. Uh, first, we uh, do have a new channel member uh, who decided to join and support the ministry who goes by the name of Lorette Teal. So thank you so much for joining and serving uh, the gospel to as many people as possible and helping me do that. Uh, I also want to send a special shout out to a new Patreon member uh, or somebody who's become part of the family, uh, a Mr. I believe Mr. Stanley Martin. So thank you so much uh, to both of you, Lorette Teal and Stanley Martin, for supporting the ministry in the way you do. And before we get started, I definitely have to say hello to some of the people in the chat uh, before we get started too. So shout out to Nate to D2, God bless you, man. He said the gift of God has arrived. And yes, you have um, richly redeemed blessings from Detroit and blessings to you as well. Uh, Brother Brian, God bless everybody. God bless you too, bro. Thank you so much for joining in. Uh, B Moses, ah, what's up, man? Good morning to you, bro. Uh, God bless and uh, much love to you as well. Um, let's see who else, who else is here? Uh, DFC Diatribe. He said Nate, but I'm sure he said something earlier. Uh, so anyway, welcome, welcome. And of course, the famous Wawo Warrior Woman. What's going on, sis? Thank you for being here. And so that's it for saying what's up to the people. Let's get into our Bible study uh, today. So let's move over to our Bible screen. There we go. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about divorce, and verses 31 and 32 is where we're at in our Sermon on the Mount series. So in verse 31 it says, It was also said, Whoever divorces his wife must give her a written notice of divorce. Verse 32. But I tell you, everyone who divorces his wife, except in a case of sexual immorality, causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Big, heavy words. So here we have Jesus in verse 31. He does what he's been doing so far in the Sermon on Mount. He mentions a law, like it was said, but I say, right? So verse 31, it says, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a written bill of divorce. Now, the law concerning divorce is not a complex one, but it's a very deep-seated one. It's one that uh, has uh, 
eternal effects on both parties. And so I definitely want to make sure we treat this topic with respect, as I do know that many of you uh, have gone through divorces or at least have witnessed divorces and the impacts they can have. So I definitely want to be sensitive to some of our viewers. Um, also, uh, divorce is a lot different today than it was back then, or at least the ramifications uh, aren't as severe today. Now, in today's day and age, uh, divorce is seen as an out, something that is an option uh, that is included with marriage, right? If I find someone and everything works out, then great, we stay together. But if for some reason I find some that we don't connect anymore, maybe we don't have the same quote unquote magical chemistry uh, we had at the beginning, I'll just get a divorce. And it's an additive, uh, unfortunately, instead of a very last last resort, all right? Um, so in today's society, it's it's a little different, right? Uh, but in that society, it was much more impactful and had huge ramifications. Um, and so uh, today, if a husband divorces his wife, the ramifications, of course, are there, right? The relationships change. Um, with, and if you have kids, they are even more dire and, you know, you're separating parents and you deal with those kinds of consequences. But after all of that, the woman and the wife can go on to live a pretty successful life. She can own her own business, own her own home, uh, ha have some land. It's not an issue. They can go on to live, you know, pretty successful lives after a divorce. But in the past, it wasn't so. Um, so, for example, women at that time, uh, during the time of Israel and the ancient Near East, you know, women were lowly regarded. They were kind of second class citizens. And that was how they were all across the board. It wasn't just the children of Israel who might have treated their women that way, but also all nations, just the culture at that time. And unfortunately, if a woman were to get a divorce or be divorced by her husband, there was only really two ways she could really support herself. Because at that time, she wasn't allowed to have her own land, have her own um, kind of career, so forth and so on. So the two options at that time for a woman were slavery and prostitution. That's, that's pretty dire. Um, and so, you know, some people will say, well, why did God give a bill of divorce? And we're going to get into a couple of those points, as I believe they are extremely important for us to discuss. So again, you know, women at that time were lowly regarded. They could not really even conduct business. They needed to have the headship of a man. It was, it's not like today we take for granted some of the freedoms we have today and we don't think about the ramifications of the past. So in this verse, what does he say? He says, whoever divorces his wife must it's not an option. It's not. It must give her a written bill of divorce. And so what I want to do is I want to talk about three things or three reasons why God might have given this. And then, of course, I definitely want to talk on the topic of what did God, what was the intention of marriage in the first place? Was it divorce? Was that the goal? Right. OK, so let's get into it. So why did God institute into the law of Israel? this written bill of divorce. Well, first, I want to start with the hardness of Israel's heart, right? So in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 8, it states, um, he told them, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because of the hardness of your heart, but it was not like that from the beginning. So, you know, when we think about marriage, right, we, we tend to think of, well, you should think of uh, long term forever till death do you part. Unfortunately, that's not the case because of the hardness of Israel's hearts at this time. I'm sure you can read some old Jewish laws, so forth and so on, where women were divorced for all kinds of foolish reasons. Oh, she burnt my toast or I didn't think she looked pretty in the morning or she, you know, whatever it was. And, and believe it or not, um, those kinds of reasons are why people get divorced today. Oh, he didn't satisfy my needs or she didn't satisfy my needs or she got sick. I wasn't expecting this. Let's get a divorce. So, so forth and so on. And so all of these reasons are happening and people are just getting divorces for, you know, things that are not important. And so God institutes in this time uh, a written bill of divorce to protect women, which is our second point, was to protect women so that they could live and survive. Because if a woman was given a written bill of divorce, it opened her up for the opportunity to be married again, right? And because she could be married again, she could be supported, she could be taken care of, so forth and so on. She could have land with her husband and build a family and still be open to that kind of thing. So again, he told them, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because of the hardness of your hearts. It was not like that from the beginning. And the beginning is talking about Adam 
and Eve from the beginning of time. Adam and Eve were placed together in the garden, and they were to be married forever till death do them part. Well, technically, they weren't supposed to die, so they were going to be married for eternity. Uh, but that's not the case, you know, and so that's not the case today, right? Marriage is not treated that way. And think about this. Adam and Eve were never, t were never told in Scripture that Adam and Eve divorced or left each other, and they had to suffer the consequences of destroying the world to some degree, and yet they still didn't get a divorce, at least based on the evidence we have in Scripture. So there are there, there's very rare instances where divorce is something that is actually a viable option. I'm not saying it's never a viable option, and we'll get into maybe some of the details when we get to the Q&A portion of, uh, of our stream, because I'm pretty sure people are going to bring it up, and I definitely want to make sure we address it. But I want to move forward in our lesson. So the first reason was that we had was Matthew 19 and verse 18, right, where it was because of the hardness of their hearts. And then our second reason why God instituted this issue of divorce was to protect women. But there's a third reason. And I think the third reason is extremely important for us to discuss because we actually witness what happens when marriage is not taken seriously in today's society. So here's what I mean. At that time, the children of Israel were supposed to be God's representatives on earth to the other nations so that the other nations can see something different other than what they have been seeing through their pagan deities and pagan gods. And so what does Israel what is Israel's job? To be the priests, to be the ones who represent Yahweh. But what happens if everybody is mistreating the women and the land falls into whoredom, where promiscuity thrives, sexual immorality thrives, fornication thrives, you're no longer a good representative. So God doesn't want the whole children of Israel to become like the other nations. But unfortunately, this is the, the consequence of not taking marriage seriously. So what does he do? He, again, gives a written bill of divorce so that at least he can put a restraint on the hardness of Israel's heart to kind of restrain their sinfulness, which is what the law was supposed to do. It was supposed to restrain. It never was meant to make a person righteous, but it was put in place to at least keep people in check until Christ came, where Christ can change your heart, right? So when we are Christians and we become Christians, God gives us a new heart, new set of desires. We are a brand new creature. So in the same way, God gives this written bill of divorce to give not only the women another chance, but the children of Israel a chance to not become like the other nations. Um, I'm going to make sure I hit all my little points. Uh, again, also, I do want to talk about the um, thing in that uh, marriage is a reflection of God's relationship with us. Uh, many times in scripture, you're going to find that uh, Israel would commit adultery, right? They would go out and be spiritually immoral with other gods, other pagan nations. Uh, they would worship their gods. They would, you know, sacrifice their sons and daughters the same way the pagan nations would. And so God had to deal with this uh, unfaithful spouse. And this is why marriage between a husband and wife is so important when it comes to being a good representation of of God. It shows his eternal love despite the hard circumstances. I um, want to make sure I touch on something else. Oh, this is the scripture I wanted to show you guys. I got a little ahead of myself, but that's okay. In Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 29, it says, do not debase your daughter by making her a prostitute or the land will be prostituted and filled with depravity. Okay. So let me ask you a question to the, well, let me ask you guys a question. In today's society, marriage is not taken as seriously as it should, right? Uh, sometimes you look at maybe the Pew Research Center and that will say something to the effect of Christians get divorced at the same rate, and that's not the case. Uh, as a matter of fact, because we believe in Christ, we actually don't get uh, divorced as, as, a, as, I guess, high rate as, you know, the worlds who don't have Christ. Uh, but that's up for everybody to debate. But if a person is truly following the Lord, they are supposed to take marriage a lot more seriously because of, it, because of it being instituted by God and it being a sacred covenant between a man and a woman. Now, looking at today's society, because they do not take marriage seriously, let me ask you all a question. Has the land fallen into whoredom? Are we seeing a rise in uh, sexual immorality? Are we seeing a rise in prostitution? Hashtag OnlyFans, right? We're seeing that that's becoming an only, uh, well, I was going to make a bad joke. But anyway, it was, <laughs> it's OnlyFans. And so we're seeing that all of a sudden you could be monetized. This is something that people are choosing. Whereas in the at the time of the ancient Near East, 
it wasn't an it wasn't a choice. It was kind of like the very last option to survive. But now people today are choosing it as a career path. And it's sad, right? Because marriage, again, isn't taken as seriously as it needs to be. And so the land has what fallen into whoredom, has fallen into prostitution, and it is filled with all kind of depravity. So there are a couple of things that um, we do need to definitely take this seriously. So let's get back to Matthew chapter 5, and now we're going to get into verse 32. All right, so verse 32 is also very, very important, and I read the scripture ahead, but that's fine. It says, uh, oh, let me bring it up for you guys to see it. Uh, verse 32, but I tell you, everyone who divorces his wife, except in a case of sexual immorality. So, now, what he's saying here is that there is an option. So if you divorce your wife, the option, well, let me see, let me read it one more time. But I tell you, everyone who divorces his wife, except in a case of sexual morality, causes her to commit adultery. So what he's saying is, if you divorce your wife, unless it's a case of sexual morality, like just let's just say she cheats on you, right? And, you know, she goes and she lies with another man right? Then you are, accept the divorce is accepted. This is an accepted um, thing. Uh, but if not, right, if you're not divorcing your wife for something like that, then you're causing her to commit adultery. In other words, you're prostituting her, right? This is why I brought up Matthew chapter 19. Uh, I'm sorry, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 29, where it says, do not debase your daughter by making her a prostitute. So this is along the same lines of what Jesus is speaking of here. So there are a couple of things. Uh, so let me make sure I got, all right. So if society, again, I want to really harp on this subject because divorce is unfortunately too easy of an option. Um, uh, what, what, uh, I forget the, um, what's the, the, help me in the chat. What's the common divorce reason? Um, is it, uh, Oh, I got it. irreconcilable differences, right? The way they just can't work it out. So I want to talk on marriage and I think I'm qualified. Uh, I've been married for om this year. I will be celebrating 19 years in October that I've been married to my most wonderful, beautiful, God-given wife, uh, Michelle. And I can tell you from 19 years of experience that there are going to be differences between the husband and the wife. You are going to get into heated debates. You're going to get into arguments. Um, there's going to be times where you give each other the silent treatment. There's going to be difficulty. There's going to be times where things aren't as romantic as they were at the beginning, where everybody's butterflies were moving around. It was brand new and fresh. But let's be honest. Marriage, if you endure those difficult times, becomes more and more beautiful over time because of the difficulty of having to learn one another, of having to understand how to disagree. And let me tell you something, you're going to find things about your spouse that you do not like, you do not understand, you do not grasp. There are things about my wife that I just don't get. There's things about me that my wife doesn't get. Another thing you'll learn wholeheartedly is how um, selfish you are. You, you probably never thought of yourself as being a selfish person, but I guarantee you, get married, and you'll realize that a lot of the things that you think are actually very selfish, and you have to learn to love. You have to learn to get past those selfish issues and that selfish behavior. And so, you know, what is, so I guess, you know, based on uh, today's title, I forgot what I titled, How to Save Your Marriage. Uh, number one, how to save your marriage would be definitely along the lines of make sure you um, build a foundation of your marriage on Christ, not on looks, not on status, not on what, you know, that kind of stuff, because over time that's going to fade. You're going to have times where you're not financially as successful as you might be. You're going to have these ebbs and flows, right? And as you get older, your spouse and you are not going to look as beautiful and radiant as you once did. So your marriage has to be able to sustain even the most difficult of circumstances. As a matter of fact, I, uh, I believe Chris Samuel and it was somebody else that also showed um, there was a video on um, on Facebook that I was watching of this older couple and this preacher. I forget who he was. Uh, bad preacher for for saying this said that there's an out. If your spouse becomes sick, you, you kind of have this out. I'm, I'm kind of butchering it. I'm trying to condense it. But basically, if your spouse becomes sick or she gets Alzheimer's, you have the right to get a divorce. No, you don't. <laughs> if you want to represent God well, you stay with your spouse till the very end. And then at the end of that uh, video, maybe I'll post a link maybe later on uh, to kind of talk about it. Um, there's this husband 
who is with his wife who has Alzheimer's and he's laying in bed with her and he's holding her and singing to her and loving her. She doesn't know who this man is, but he's there to the end. And it's supposed to be a representation. Your love for your spouse is supposed to be a representation of how much God loves you, right? Does God leave you when you are at your worst? Does God leave you when you commit adultery and worship other pagan gods? Did God leave the children of Israel or did he or did he stay with them? Was he faithful? Was he a faithful husband? That's what we're supposed to be. So divorce should not be an option to a Christian unless it is dire circumstances. And I will talk again, we'll talk about that later today. So there are a couple of things. Uh, I want to make sure I hit all my points. Okay. So the last two points is what does God want to stop? right? Uh, he wants Israel not to be like the other nations. He does not want them to, to fall into these horrible, horrible um, behaviors. Uh, so back to the Bible screen, we'll read these two verses, and then we'll uh, kind of wrap this small lesson up. It's only two verses today, so today won't be as long. Uh, but again, make sure you guys stick to the end because I'm going to be answering another question, and it's going to have to deal with marriage and relationships. So again, verse 32 states, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, must give her a written notice of divorce. But I tell you, everyone who divorces his wife, except in a case of sexual immorality, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So hopefully uh, this Bible lesson on the Sermon on the Mount series has been extremely helpful. Hopefully I've touched on very important things. And I want to make sure you guys go ahead and leave your comments because I definitely want to interact with you at the end of the stream. Okay, with that said. Okay, so now we're going to answer the question that was left in my comments section where we were. I was talking about, um, you know what, let's just get into it. Okay, so how do I, so here's the question, how to respond when a brother or sister cuts you off? We're going to talk about some biblical insights and tips and wisdom. So here's the question. It came from a, a, one of our Facebook uh, supporters, Anitra Davis. She says, what if the brother or sister, wait, let me change the screen a little bit. Okay, so the question is, what if the brother or sister have something against you and they cut you off with no explanation when you have tried to reconcile with them? What scriptures back this up? So I recently received this comment under my uh, Freedom from Anger video in the Sermon on the Mount series where we touched on a couple of important points, especially when it comes to reconciling with your brother or sister in Christ and how you do not want to hold on to a grudge. And if they have something against you, you want to be able to go and reconcile that before judgment, right? And we talked about the severity of that. And of course, it sparked this question. Well, what if you go to this person and they cut you off? Are you still liable? Are you still held accountable for not reconciling at judgment day? Well, let's deal with it biblically, which is something that I appreciate when people ask, can you give me some biblical support for the answer you're about to give me? So shout out to you for that. Okay, so the first scripture I want to go to is basically where it kind of uh, began. So we, when we covered this verse, it says, so if you are offering your gift, on, and this is Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 to 26, uh, it says, so if you are offering your gift on the altar, and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled with your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Reach a settlement quickly with your adversary while you're on the way with him to court, or your adversary will hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out of there until you have paid the last penny. So, of course, this is what sparked the question specifically. Uh, I want to make sure I highlight a couple of things, and then I want to give you a little bit of biblical wisdom that I think would answer your question in a sufficient way. And, of course, if any of you have any really good insights into this, please leave it in the live chat or leave it in the comment section and try to help this sister out as well, right? So he says, if you are offering your gift on the altar and there you remember that your brother has or sister has something against you, this is not all of a sudden it comes to your mind, oh, I have a, I have an issue with somebody. No, you remember that they have an issue with you. What does it say? Leave your gift there in front of the altar and first go be reconciled with your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. So what I find interesting in this is that at this moment, the Lord finds it to be more important to actually go and be reconciled than to actually offer your gift. In other words, you not reconciling will actually hinder your relationship with God. 
it will hinder your worship. It will hinder you offering gifts or making an offering to the Lord or in maybe simple terms, your worship with the Lord. And then it says, reach a settlement quickly with your adversary, so forth and so on. And so what do you do when you know, you, you realize this and then you go to this person and they cut you off. They don't want to have anything to deal with you. Are you still held accountable? Well, there are a couple of things I definitely want to take into consideration. I want to make sure I put into your mind. And, and this is going off the assumption that you actually have done everything you're supposed to do according to Matthew 18, so forth and so on in scripture. And, and you did everything you did to reconcile. This is me just going off of this information. So in Romans chapter 12, there's a couple of things I want to point out. Now, of course, let me give you the context of Romans 12. Here, uh, the Apostle Paul is giving um, some information to the body of Christ as they are being persecuted, and he's telling them to live at peace with individuals as best you can. All right, so let me read it from, let's say, 13. Uh, it says, uh, share with the saints in their needs, pursue hospitality, bless those who persecute you, and bl uh, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Then here, verse 16, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, instead associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Give careful thought to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. Now, here's the point. He's telling them this and how to behave while they're being persecuted by other nations and other people. Both the Jews and the Gentiles are persecuting the Christians. And these individuals are told to be at peace, to be humble. Don't be wise in your own estimation. Don't repay evil for evil. When they mistreat you, don't you go back and mistreat them. Verse 18. Now, this is the verse that I want you to focus on because I think it's extremely important. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. That's a very important verse because there are going to be times where the children of Israel were being persecuted and they were doing their very best not to engage, not to fight against the people, not to render evil for evil, right? But he says, as far as it depends on you. In other words, you do everything you're supposed to do. Now, there still may be conflict. There still may be issues. There still may be problems. But as long as you do what you are supposed to do, as much as depends on you, be at peace with everyone. So in the case of this person who uh, maybe has cut you off, do everything you're supposed to do. Don't say, oh, well, because they're not talking to me, I'm not going to pursue. No, no, try. And if then they cut you off, then okay, you're okay. It's not, you're not going to be held liable. But I want to give a little bit of wisdom pertaining to this and tie in today's message of marriage. And I want to show you where you can know for a certainty that if you've done everything you could on your end, that you will not be in bondage in that case. And what we're going to do is we're going to use marriage in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7, verses 10 through 16. Okay, here we go. To the married, and again, this is good because it ties into our marriage uh, uh, portion of today's lesson, but also the question when we get to the, to the latter verses. Okay, to the married, I give this command, not I, but the Lord. A wife is not to leave her husband, but if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and a husband is not to divorce his wife. So here is laid out. Women shouldn't divorce their husbands. And husbands shouldn't divorce their wives. They should stay together forever. Now, here's an interesting concept, though. Now, what Paul is going to do is to give you some practical and biblical wisdom. Okay? Now, again, let me set this up for you. The children of Israel who have repented and have put their faith in Christ are going to experience some turmoil, some difficult circumstances. Some relationships are going to change. Right. Because you have some people who are believers who are married to now unbelievers. But we'll get into it. Verse 12. But I, not the Lord, say to the rest, if any brother has an unbelieving wife and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. All right. So here we have a circumstance where the husband is a believer. He's a believer in Christ, but his wife is not a believer. What should he do? Now, this is not saying that believers should go out and marry unbelievers. That is definitely what not, this verse is not teaching. What it is teaching is if you are already married and one of you becomes a believer, 
Are you then free to divorce the unbeliever because they're not a believer? Well, there are some circumstances here. He says, uh, if any brother has an unbelieving wife and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. So she still loves you. She still cares for you. She still wants to be with you. You have to remain married. You cannot put her away. Verse 13, then it flips the, the tables a little bit. Also, if any woman has an unbelieving husband and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce her husband and vice versa, what I just explained earlier. Why is this important for Paul to address? Because at this time, the gospel is going out. You have people who are married. You have individuals who are uh, husbands who are married to wives and the husband became a believer, but the wife didn't become a believer. Now the question is, should I divorce her because she's an unbeliever? Well, he says, no. If she's willing to stay with you, then work it out. Make it work. All right? And, and so how I'm tying this together is if God takes marriage this seriously, then, of course, the relationships between brothers and sisters in Christ, and also even with the world to some degree, are just as important. In other words, you have to conduct yourself in a manner. So, for example, if you went to your friend and they were willing to talk with you, you don't cut them off. You work it out, right? If you if they are willing to work with you and they are willing to be your friend and they're willing to hear you out, then you have to, by God's commandments, you have to work it out and reconcile with them. Verse 14, and, and, and this is what the effect it can have, right? So for the unbelieving husband is made holy by the wife, right? She creates that sacred space within that marriage. And the unbelieving wife is made holy by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. Verse 15. Now, this is the verse that I want you to pay attention to. Verse 15, specifically with the question you asked. But if the unbeliever leaves, what does it say? Make them stay? No. Let him leave. And what does it say after that? A brother or a sister is not bound in such cases. God has called you to live in peace. Right. So what does he say? Let's just say let's break the scenario down and make it very simple to understand. Let's say you have a husband who is a believer and the wife is an unbeliever. Now, the husband has done everything he could to make it work with the wife, but the wife wants nothing to do with him and his newfound Christianity and relationship with the Lord. And she leaves him. Is he bound to her? No, he is now free to marry someone else. Right. And he that, I mean, you know, of course, legally in today's society, there's going to be a divorce and things like that, but he's not bound to that circumstance anymore. He's not bound to her because she chose to leave him and desert him. This is called, talking about deserting. So when we get to the point of your question, what do you do when you try to reconcile with someone and they cut you off? Well, based on this wisdom that we can glean from this scripture, although it is not talking about marriage, right? I mean, although it is talking about marriage, the wisdom we can glean from this is if they do not want anything to do with you, you are not going to be bound to that command in the sense that now you are not held liable. You are not guilty. When it comes to judgment day, God is not going to look at you and say, well, you couldn't reconcile with that person. Therefore, you're not going to make it into the kingdom of heaven. That's not the case, right? You are no longer bound to that person. You've done everything you possibly could to reconcile, hopefully. And if you have, you can rest in peace and rest in Christ that you are not held guilty because you followed his commands all the way to the very end. Okay. So with that said, let me make sure. Okay. That was it. Uh, so let's get into the comments section. Let's see what you guys have been talking about. If you have any questions about anything I discussed today, make sure you put it in the comment section live or in the replay, and I will try to address. And if you have questions that you want me to answer in this kind of format, make sure you put it in the comments and in the live chat, and I'll go back and I'll look and I'll find and I'll glean and I'll try to find questions that I can actually answer. I'd and maybe questions I can't answer, and I'll just study it out for a long time. And then maybe it can appear at the end of one of our live streams, just like I did today. So let's say what's up to some of the people. Let's see what they've been talking about. Let's scroll up. Um, 
And if you enjoyed today's lesson, uh, please consider hitting the like button, subscribing, and sharing this Bible lesson with one of your friends or your church member, your church community group, or your church email or whatever. Um, also, uh, if you would like to become part of, uh, well, if you would like to receive a free newsletter from this ministry every month on the 15th of every month, uh, make sure you click the link in the live chat or click the link in the description uh, to my um, newsletter. You can subscribe and it's free, right? You don't have to pay to get the newsletter and you'll get one every month on the 15th of every month. Last week, I actually um, uh, sent out a newsletter dealing with three simple Bible tips to help you understand the Bible better. Uh, I've gotten a lot of really good feedback from it. People really enjoyed it. So if you want access to that kind of stuff for free, make sure you subscribe to the newsletter in the link uh, below or in the live chat. Okay, let's see what everybody's been talking about. Uh, and let's see if I missed anybody who's maybe jumped in. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, Warrior Woman, she says, divorce has multi-generational uh, far-reaching consequences. You are absolutely right. You got new kids are added into the mix when a parent remarries, leaving less time for that parent with their existing kids. I've seen this happen. You're absolutely correct. Remember, divorce doesn't just happen to two people. It happens to everybody who's ever been connected to those two people. It affects friendships. It, you know, for example, sometimes you'll have friends that are a, a couple's friend and then they have to choose sides or, you know, whatever, you know, so it, it, it's a lot of damage. And of course, especially to the children as well. So thank you so much, Warrior, warrior Woman, for uh, doing that or, or leaving that comment. Uh, let's see who else, who else, what else we got here? Uh, let me expand my little comment section so I can see it all at once. Um, <laughs> She said, even penguins do uh, lifetime monogamy better than us humans. <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 that's funny. <laughs> um, yo, shout out to CMB, the ambassador. What's going on? Listen, guys, if you want to make sure you go, go and subscribe to him. Um, he is actually in the book of Hebrews, and they are far. Uh, there's a lot of information. Make sure you guys go subscribe and, and listen to that. Uh, he's, they're doing a great job over there. Make sure you guys go and support him. So shout out to you, CMB. God bless you, bro. Um, uh, DFC says, uh, careful people will grab onto their advocation of penguin relationships and throw in there on the homo. Oh my goodness. <laughs> you guys, what are you talking about? Um, uh, at SOC and prostitution is advocated. Yes. A lot of people are actually defending that as a, a viable option for support and i'm like I'm like come on you, you're destroying yourself that's a sin against your own body diseases and all kinds of things you guys got to stay away from that this whole only fans movement where people feel empowered to show their bodies and they're free they're actually not free they're in bondage to sin all right individuals are more free sexually if they are in a monogamous relationship one man one woman married for life will experience greater sexual intimacy than individuals who quote unquote believe they have the freedom to have multiple partners, right? Because they always end up empty, filled with diseases, their body is wrecked, and now they have all these experiences and they still feel empty, right? It is a deception from Satan. So definitely, uh, let's see. Uh, let me see, Warrior Woman said, it used to be taboo. Now we have young guys and girls being PM openly paid for fetish photos on OnlyFans like it's no big deal. Yeah, unfortunately, that is the case in today's society. Um, so thank you for that, Warrior Woman. Good morning to you, Dana Owens. What's going on, sis? Nice to see you. Um, let me see. Make sure I say hello to everybody. Apologist in Detroit. Nice to see you, brother. God bless you. I love you. And thanks for being here, man. I really, really do. Uh, I'm glad you're here, man. Uh, DFC diatribe, no unequal yoking in faith. Absolutely. Let's talk about that for a little bit. Is that mean, right, for God to say you can't be with an unbeliever? Is that a little limiting? Yes, but it also limits sin, confusion, destruction, problems, right? For example, let's just say you're a Christian and you find this atheist extremely attractive. You go marry them. You guys get along. It feels good in the beginning, but then you have kids. Now, how are you going to raise the kids? Are they going to be Christian? Are they going to be atheist? Now you're going to have to fight with your husband or with your spouse, right? How are we going to raise these children, right? And so now it impacts everything, right? You're going to want to go to church. They're not going to want to go to church. 
You know, there are going to be some financial aspects that happen. Well, I don't want to support the ministry. I don't want to support the church. I, I want to support the church. Now, all of a sudden, there's fights, there's bickering, there's arguments, there's trauma, there's the children don't know what to believe. And, you know, all of these problems happen as a result of unequally yoked. What God is saying is marry a Christian, marry somebody who is a believer because you guys are going to be equally yoked. And this is kind of using uh, when it says unequally yoked is talking about in the uh, I was going to say, the well, the farm sense or, you know, the agricultural sense where you have two oxen and they were supposed to you know be plowing a field or whatever it is, that mechanism. I don't know what it is. If you know what it is, put it in the live chat. Anyway, they would do this mechanism and they'd have to work together. If you had one oxen that was really strong and the other one was really weak, it would be uneven. The things wouldn't get handled the way it should. So here, this unequal yoking, if you have two strong oxen or two individuals who are in the faith of Christ, you will move easier together. You will be able to endure life's hardships a lot better than if you were unequally yoked. So shout out to you for that. Uh, richly redeemed says selfish, huh? That must be why I'm single. Oh my goodness. <laughs> well, you are selfish, bro. Uh, or says, um, I think bro, I'm not sure. <laughs> so, uh, richly redeemed. Yeah. You're, you're selfish. We're all selfish, right? We, we tend to, to ease our selfishness, um, off of ourselves, uh, in an attempt to make ourselves seem a little more humble than we are. But over time, when you're married, you actually learn your selfishness and you learn to be more humble and more giving and more caring. So we are all selfish. It's not just you. Um, and that's not why you're single. We, when we when people get married, they're selfish. So that that's not a hindrance unless you're just, you know, some kind of astronomically selfish we don't know about. Uh, war, I guess you'll be labeled a troll. I don't know what that's in reference to. Uh, maybe something I said earlier. Um, uh, DFC says, sounds like uh, the video advocating pornography usage by De Dennis pra Prager. Uh, if your wife has Alzheimer's, it's okay to watch. Oh, yeah, that's terrible. So, oh, man, that is wicked. Right. So what he's saying and, and to you guys out there. Um, so he's saying you could watch uh, sexually explicit things on film because your wife has Alzheimer's. No, you can't. And here's how you know why. If you are single, you're not supposed to be watching that kind of material. So marriage, just using it as a scapegoat is absolutely wicked. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, Al Alzheimer's is not an excuse to watch sexually uh, explicit material. Sorry. Uh, but I, I like that you brought that up because people will make uh, the argument. And I, I, if you guys ever run into any videos where they're making those kinds of arguments, send them to me. I can do some response videos and show some biblical insight. So if you guys ever run across anything you would like me to react to, something that is profitable for the body of Christ and, you know, I can use scripture for, I'll be glad to react to it. Um, let's see. Uh, DFC says, I think you cannot get in touch with them by any of your own power. Uh, prayer to God for reconciliation and repenting for your part of the offense like King David did seems like it should suffice. Very good. Very, very good advice. Yeah. So if you can't get, 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 get in touch with the person or you can't reconcile, it's not your, it's not, it's not an issue anymore. You, you did what you could, right? Be, you're free in Christ. Um, let me see who else is here. Madeline, she says, good morning, all. Welcome, welcome, sis. Um, and thank you for joining us here at Servant of Christ Ministries. Um, let me see. Let me see. If the divorce is happening between two believing spouses and the children were just recently baptized, that can make them view the faith in a distorted manner, I guess. Yes. Uh, and that's the thing, right? Because again, divorce does not just happen between a husband and wife. Children are affected. They think that's a viable option. Like, oh, well, if I just don't like them, I just get a divorce, right? Um, you know, so these are things we definitely got to take into consideration. So definitely, thank you, thank you. Um, let me see what else we got. Dana Owen, she says, as Christians, reconciliation is the aim. However, it doesn't always end up being the case. Reconciliation is the goal, though. Absolutely. And that answers the question very well as well, because individuals think that this is if you do everything right, then everything will go right. That's not the case. And that traps a lot of people because they say, well, I did everything according to what the Lord said, and they still hate my guts. That's on them. It's not on you. Right. This is why the scripture I brought up earlier, let me get it again um, so you guys can see it. And it kind of goes along with what uh, Dana's saying here. Uh, verse 18 of um, Romans chapter 12, if possible, as far as it depends on you, 
live at peace with everyone. So when he says, if possible, it's saying that it's also possible that people are still going to attack you despite you being nice. But what he's saying here is that as much as you can do, as, as far as it depends on you, you do what you're supposed to do on your end, do what you can. Do you think Christians, uh, let me give you an example. How many of you here think that um, individuals who are Christian, who behave in Christ-like manner, do you think that they ever have any persecution despite them doing the right thing? Right? That's a question for you. Absolutely. No matter what happens, you can do the right thing. You can do it perfect the way the Lord said it, and you will still have issues. The goal isn't to have a perfect life, but to do what the Lord commands. That is living a life worth living, right? To do what he commands, not that life becomes all of a sudden great. Um, uh, uh, it says, pray for a brother. This is the state the Lord found me in. <laughs> You're so funny. Um, Dana Owens Either you are going to influence them or they're going to influence you. Absolutely, sis. Uh, Major says, I love the stream. Keep spreading the word of God, my brother. Thank you so much for the encouragement. That comment meant a whole lot to me. Thank you so much. Sometimes it can be discouraging when not a lot of people get to see these videos just because of the low view count. But when I see comments like that, it makes it all worth it. It makes it all worth it. I'm like, okay, let's just keep it going. Okay. Um, well, it looks like we don't have, uh, it says Dennis Prager is not a Christian. I've never heard of Dennis Prager. I'll look him up. Um, but I'm interested in that article because uh, I would like to make a video on it. That's actually a very good thing. So uh, to the one who brought it up, I'm sorry, I can't quite remember who's the one that brought it up. I don't, I don't know if it was DFC. If you did, whoever brought it up, make sure you email me uh, a link maybe to the article or to the video. Uh, my email is servantofchristministries at gmail.com or just put it in the comments section below under this video after we finish our stream. So with that said, doesn't look like we have any more comments. So I definitely want to thank you all for being here. Make sure you guys subscribe to the free newsletter. The link is in the description. If you would like to support the ministry, uh, like our friends did at the beginning, uh, Lorette Teal and Stanley Martin, who became channel members and Patreon members, if you want to support the ministry and you want to see videos like this, get more views and get out there more, make sure you hit the like button. Make sure you subscribe. Share this with your friends and family and enemies, and everybody you know. And also, uh, again, there are links in the description box where you can help in a multiplicity of ways. Well, with that said, God bless you guys. Take care, and I will see you on the next stream next week when we get into our Sermon on the Mount series. Well, when we continue. Until next time, God bless, and I will see you later. Peace.